Lord Jesus, you know the needs and the concerns each one of us has, and I pray those needs will be met according to your will, and I ask for comfort and healing to all who are experiencing any type of pain in their lives, heal their emotional wounds uh, that we suffer from, and fill our spiritual longing with your presence. Bless us more than we deserve, and keeping our heads bowed, Lord, we remember the suffering of so many on this day 21 years ago when so many lives were lost because of evil and wickedness. May those who oppose you not prosper and may you comfort those who lost loved ones on this day uh, 21 years ago. We humbly... uh, ask this in your name. Amen. We've been using our Look to Jesus Bible reading plan to read through the entire Bible this year as a church. Now, how many of you have been doing that? I have. Uh, I imagine many of you have as well. You you might be new here at Holly, though, and you're going, "I, I didn't even know we had a Look to Jesus Bible reading plan. Well, you can request one by emailing us at hello at hollychurch.org. We'll send you uh, a Look to Jesus Bible reading plan. And you don't have to go back to January. You can just begin on the day you receive the Bible reading plan and join with us in reading uh, the Bible together. Now, if you want to catch up, you can go back, but don't put that pressure on yourself. Do you recognize or have you heard of any of these books or have you read any of them? The Hill We Climb, The Midnight Library, How About Clara and the Sun, The Vanishing Half, The Four Winds, Cloud Cuckoo Land, Project Hail Mary, The Lincoln Highway, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, Beautiful World, Where Are You? Now, I hadn't heard of any of those books or read any of them. And perhaps you have read some of them or heard of some of them or perhaps not. But those were the top-selling books of 2021, just one year ago. And most of us wouldn't even know what those books were about or had never even heard of those books. But if I say the Bible, most people have heard of the Bible. They know what the Bible is. And when it comes to books... None can match the Bible. The words have been treasured through the ages, committed to memory, printed in scrolls. Numerous copies have been made. They've been bound in books. They've been narrated on tape and CD, and they've been programmed into apps. And when it comes to books that sell, you talk about a bestseller, the Bible stands apart. Over the past 50 years, 3.9 billion Bibles have sold. The next closest book has sold 820 million copies over the past 50 years. Now, this chart you're seeing illustrates how many more Bibles sell compared to other uh, top-selling books over the past 50 years. Year after year, the, the Bible sales skyrocket over other books. And you say, well, why isn't the Bible on the best-selling uh, book list then? Well, every single best-selling book list finds a way to keep the Bible off of their list because I guess the only thing I can say is because they don't want to admit that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time, year after year. And when it comes to books with influence, the, the Bible's fingerprints are everywhere. You know, the Bible's fingerprints are on the best laws and constitutions of the greatest nations. And when those fingerprints begin to be removed out of a society, then you end up with a a culture that's unable seemingly to be able to reason or think past kind of a, a middle school grade level. The Bible's influence shows up in other books. It shows up in music and media of all types. In endurance, in influence, in sales, all other books pale in comparison to the Bible. Now, why is that? Well, why is the Bible unlike any other book? Well, in every message of this series, I'm going to be talking about all the different reasons 
why the Bible is different, why it's unlike every other book. But just to begin with, uh, you need to have a good overview of what the Bible is uh, to be able to understand it and to be able to begin to get a hold of this idea of why it's unlike any other book. The Bible reveals the mind and will of God. It tells us what kind of God our Creator is. It tells us what His desires are for His creation. Exodus 34, 6 through 7, tells us the mind and the will of God. Yahweh passed by before Him, now that's before Moses, and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth, keeping loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and disobedience and sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children, on the third and on the fourth generation. He is a loving God who desires to have a relationship with his uh, creation, with us, but he's also a just God. He won't allow sin to go unpunished. The Bible describes the work of God. It speaks of his creative powers. You know, everything you see has been created by him or because of him and of his work to restore us to his original intention. People who are fully alive, untainted by sin's destructive power. Why is the Bible unlike any other book? Well, the Bible draws us to faith in God. The Bible tells us where we came from, why we exist, why we're so messed up, how we can relate to God or how we should relate to God, how we should relate to each other and how everything one day will be made completely right and completely whole again. The Bible gives us daily and eternal hope. You know, I'm I'm not sure how people function. I I know they do function, (laughs) at least seemingly so, but I'm just not sure how people function without the Lord without living in the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that He is King. For me, that's an indispensable reason why the Bible is unlike any other book, because it gives me daily and eternal hope. The Bible gives purpose and meaning to life. Now, I understand other religions and causes can give people a purpose, at least uh, purpose in this world. But I would argue that there is nothing that brings more meaning and more purpose into a person's life than to understand they are created in the very image of God and that he wants to have a relationship with you and then he wants you to join in his mission of helping other people have a friendship, a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, all to his praise, all to his glory. People throughout history and still today speak highly of the Bible. Famous scientist Sir Isaac Newton said, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God, written by those who were inspired. Now we'll talk about what that word inspired means here just in a bit. I study the Bible daily. Ronald Reagan said, Within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. Denzel Washington, I read the Bible every day. Theodore Roosevelt, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. You know, especially when the college education is telling you God doesn't exist. And then Mark Twain said this, a little tongue-in-cheek, a little humor here. It ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It is the parts that I do understand. The Bible does make some monumental claims about itself. It says it is the light that guides people back to God. It says it's the medicine to revive the sick. It says it gives wisdom to those who are wise to make them wiser, and it'll give wisdom to make fools wise. It tells us what is right and what is wrong. It says, this is right, this is wrong. It doesn't matter what culture you live in, how they define things. This is what's right, this is what's wrong. It insists it's more valuable than gold and sweeter than honey. The Bible 
claims that the words on its pages aren't static, but rather those words are living and active. This means the words of the Bible are or could always be at work in your life and in the life of others around you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. This means the Bible speaks to the spiritual part of you. Of both joints and marrow, it speaks to the physical part of you. And is able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It speaks to your mind and it speaks to your emotions. It speaks to every part of you. It's living and active in your spiritual life. It's living and active in your physical life. It's living and active in your mind. It's living and active in your emotions. And, and it's my belief, it's my theory at least, that that's why many want to dismiss the Bible from being God's word. Because they don't want God being living and active in their life and telling them, hey, what you're doing is wrong or not right, and there's a better way for you because people think they know best, right? So they don't want the Word of God to be living and active. They don't want someone telling them, well, what you're doing isn't right, it's wrong. Besides being living and active, the Bible claims to be the very words of God. This is a very big claim it makes, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All Scripture. Scripture is a word for, that describes the words that are in the Bible. You could say it's sacred words. So all Scriptures, the words we find in the Bible, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, what does it mean when the Apostle Paul says it's God-breathed? That's, that's what Sir Isaac Newton meant by it's inspired. That to be God-breathed means uh, the words found in, in the Bible are inspired. Well, right now, you're listening to my breath because my voice, my breath is coming up over my vocal cords, vibrating those vocal cords and coming out as words that you're hearing. If I didn't have any breath, I wouldn't have any voice. When someone's out of breath, you know, they, they can't speak. So what you're hearing right now is the, the breath or the voice, the words of Kevin Hill. And the Bible says it's God's breath. It's God's words. It's his very breath speaking to us. Well, yes, men wrote it down, but God breathed the words that he wanted them to uh, write down. Not in some robotic manner. Each author has their own style. They have their own personality. But God breathed those words they were writing. And that's a big claim the Bible makes, that it's God's word to us. So how can we know if that's true or, or not, or if it's fact or fiction or maybe a little bit of both? I think those are totally valid questions when it comes to the Bible. And Lord willing... <laughs> We're going to be answering those questions as we go through this series. During this series, I want to help you get firmly in your mind that this book isn't exactly like any other. It's not just any old book. That this book leads to life, that this book leads to love, that this book leaves, leads to purpose, that this book leads to hope. So the Bible makes these big claims about itself, and many people over the years, you know, have recommended reading it and using it, while others say, well, not so much. So let's start uh, to, to get a grasp on what the Bible is, why it's so important uh, for a life of faith. Let's start with an overview of the Bible. What kind of book is the Bible? We've, we've said it's a book like no other. Well, what does Bible mean? Well, the word Bible comes from an ancient word for papyrus, and papyrus was a plant-based material used for writing very early on. You would write on it. And uh, from, that br from that term, it broadened to mean uh, a book, a Bible meant a book or a scroll. And then... <laughs> It began to narrow again to mean a holy book or a holy scroll, 
scroll until finally it really narrowed down to one particular book, and that's the, the Christian Bible. That's when you hear the word Bible, that's what you think of. And so we often think of the Bible, though, as being this one book. I just said it's the book and all that, but it's really 66 books uh, put together in one volume. 39 books make up the Old Testament. So right around 76% of the Bible is the Old Testament, books that were written before Jesus' birth. Then 27 books make up the New Testament. So right around 24% of the Bible is New Testament books, books that were written after Jesus' birth. Now, from beginning to end, the Bible provides a unified picture of who God is, and that's rather amazing. It's hard for one author to keep a unified picture in the book or the books they write, let alone all the different authors. Every author of the Bible has the same unified picture of God, written over centuries of time, and yet the same unified picture of God. So from beginning to end, the Bible provides a unified picture of who God is, who we are, and what we need most. It's not just a collection of stories and words that are tossed together haphazardly, but it's been carefully collected and placed within a structure. The Bible begins in the past at creation, and it ends in the future, you know, what's happening in the future with the book of Revelation. The Bible, both Old and New Testaments, are grouped together by literary genre. Now, I probably wouldn't agree. I would have probably gone more along the lines of a chronological order, but my thought process is totally different than the thought process of those folks who are uh, collecting these books of the Bible together. So both Old and New Testaments are grouped together by literary genre. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you go into a bookstore or you go into a library, the books are grouped by literary genre. For example, there'll be a history section and there'll be a poetry section and so on and so forth. Well, the Old Testament does the same thing. And the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, sometimes called the Pentateuch, uh, more commonly called the law. So here's the Old Testament structure. The law. Genesis to Deuteronomy. The law is not just a list of do's and don'ts, but rather these five books tell the story of God choosing a people through which Jesus will be born. And then after the law, the rest of the New Old Testament is grouped like this. We have history. That's Joshua to Esther. We have poetry, which is Job to Song of Solomon. We have the major prophets, Isaiah to Daniel. The minor prophets, Hosea to Malachi. Now, they are designated major and minor prophets due to the length of their writings, not because the major prophets are more important than the minor prophets. No, the major prophets wrote more. Their books are longer than the minor prophets are. Their, their books are shorter. The Old Testament details how one could have a right relationship with God before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to life. God always relates to us through what's called a covenant, and which is why some people wonder, well, why is the Bible called, you know, why is one section of the Bible called the Old Testament and the other the New Testament? Well, to answer that question, you really have to understand what the word testament means. The word testament means covenant. And that's the way God always relates to us, always has a friendship with us. It's through a covenant. The word covenant means agreement. It's actually the strongest kind of agreement someone could have. It's a binding agreement. And before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to life, to have a right relationship with God, you follow the terms of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. And after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to life, to have a right relationship with God, you follow the terms of the New Testament or the New Covenant. And so every covenant has parties, terms, and promises. So in the Old Testament case, it, the parties were you and God, and the terms were 
that you were going to live perfectly. And the promises were that God would be with you, God would bless you, you'd have eternal life. Now, the problem with the old covenant is that we have a really hard time living perfectly. We, we just can't do it. And so God says, see, you can't do it on your own, so I've got the solution here. I'm sending my son Jesus to die for you on the cross, and he's going to usher in a new covenant or a new testament, and Jesus does just that. And so, you know, he lives a perfect life. He dies for our sins. He, he takes the punishment that's due us. And so, uh, under the new covenant, the parties are uh, you and Jesus. The terms are you will have faith in Jesus. That means you will believe in and act on that belief. You'll, you'll follow Jesus daily. You'll stay faithful to Jesus. That's the terms. The promises are, well, Jesus will love you. He'll always be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll forgive your sins. He'll give you past, present, and future. He'll give you a future in eternity. He gives the gift of eternal life. He promises you blessings here and now. And it's because of Jesus' death for us that we can live in such a way that motivates us to love God and to love others. The Old Testament is all about leading up to Jesus. It's all about why we need Jesus and that Jesus is coming. And the New Testament is all about Jesus. It's, it's why and why we need Jesus and that Jesus is coming, you know, back. He's returning. Two Testaments, two covenants, Two binding agreements, but the same God, the same Lord. Not two different gods. Not an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. Nope, the same God. Just two different testaments, two different covenants. So the New Testament structure is like this. The Gospels, which is Matthew to John, and these tell the story of Jesus. Matthew's an apostle. John's an apostle. They're eyewitnesses. Mark writes another gospel. He's friends with the Apostle Peter, so his writing comes from the Apostle Peter. And then Luke tells us, you know, he reads the other gospels, he interviews eyewitnesses, and then he writes his gospel of Luke. Then there's the history of the church. That's Acts. Acts tells the story of the apostles giving their eyewitness testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah, you know. They saw him dead, and then he rose to life again. And so it, it chronicles the beginning of the church as the apostles say you can be saved through Jesus Christ. Then you have the letters, and these are Romans to Jude. We often call these books, but they're not actually books. They're really letters, letters written by the apostles Paul, Peter, and John, and then by Jesus' brothers, his half-brothers, James and Jude. And these letters are written to churches and to individuals. Then we have the apocalyptic, which is Revelation. The Apostle John writes this book and it foretells future events using very vivid imagery. The Old Testament books were written between approximately 1445 BC to 400 BC. And the New Testament books were written approximately between AD 45 AD, AD. Uh, B.C. simply means before Christ, and A.D. means in the year of the Lord. Now, my contention, I believe the New Testament books were all written before A.D. 70, with the possible exception of Revelation. And I am going to pause here to say a little bit about these dates that I've given for the writing of the Old Testament and especially the New Testament books. Now, this type of stuff I really geek out on, so I have to like, try to make sure I'm balancing. I, I want to be balancing, not boring. So uh, hopefully I'm on the side of balancing here. And I want to talk to you about these dates because critics of the Bible will say to you with a straight face, like it is undisputed truth, and like you're an absolute moron if you would disagree with them, if you think otherwise, that the books of the Bible were all written much later than the dates that I've just shown you. Now, they don't really have any damning evidence that the Bible was written 
much later on than these dates that I've given you. They simply make this claim with much confidence, much confidence many times, outright just lying or outright deceive themselves because they want to make the assertion to you and everyone else that the Bible can't be trusted. That, you know, somebody just made it up years later after the events they're supposedly writing about. So I'm just going to give you one example of how this late uh, writing is not valid, how this concept of these books were written way later is not valid. There are four Gospels. Gospel means good news. These four Gospels are the good news story of Jesus. They're sort of like autobiographies about Jesus. And if you're trying to dispute or you're trying to downplay their validity, that Jesus was even a real person, you're going to want them uh, written as far away as possible from when Jesus was here on earth. And in the past, and even in the present, some critics of the Bible claim that the gospel according to Mark, the earliest gospel, was not written until around A.D. 130, so a hundred years after Jesus was here. Now, many have toned down their rhetoric because of all the evidence to the contrary of such a late date for the writing of Mark. And now they'll claim that Mark was written around A.D. 70, so 40 years after Jesus was here on earth. Now, they're really still leaving out some very important evidence uh, And what they say is not necessarily true because a portion of the book of Mark was found uh, way back in 1972. Now, I've never seen any critic ever mention these portions of Mark being found when they're talking about the dating of when Mark was being written. Now, it wasn't the whole book of Mark that was found. It was four verses. But these four verses, which match exactly with the book of Mark we have right in our Bibles today, the four verses that were found were all dated 50 A.D., only 20 years after Jesus was here on earth. And these four fragments come not from the original uh, that Mark wrote down, but from a manuscript, from a copy of Mark's original and I'll tell you why we can trust these copies next week's message, but that would mean Mark's gospel would have been written even before A.D. 50. Now, the importance of this, the reason they want to extend the link between when Jesus was here and when the first gospel was written about him is because they want to tell you that well, yeah, Jesus was maybe a real person, but then all these myths came up about him being the son of God and doing miracles and all that stuff. Well, when you shorten that time frame, now in today's world, a myth can probably start in about five minutes because of the internet, but it wasn't like that in the past. It'd take at least about 100 years for a myth to develop about some historical person. So when you consider that the Gospel of Mark was written let's say, let's even say 80, 50, but we know it was sooner than that. That's within 20 years of when Jesus was here. That's, there's not enough time for some myth to have grown up about Jesus. That's the importance of, uh, of in critics' minds, of why they need to get the books of, about Jesus written so much later. To sum up today's message, the Bible is God's gift to you. It's two Testaments collecting 66 books, written, assembled, and preserved so that you might know God and the salvation he offers through Jesus. Let's pray. Lord and Creator, thank you for giving us words that reveal who you are and who we are. May your word be living and active in our lives on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. On your connection card page this week, so if you haven't already opened up your connection card page, you can do that by clicking on the link in the description if you're on Facebook or YouTube, or hit the button right below the video if you're at Holly Church Online. 
on your connection card, you're going to see a next step that says, I will pray daily for God's word to be living and active in, in my life. Would you pray that each day this week? I, Lord, may your word be living and active in my life. Will you take that next step? I hope so.